Welcome everybody to Calculus BC. In today's episode, we're going to be discussing chapter 8.2, which is the separable differential equation. Now, this chapter is actually a trip down memory lane for us. Uh, we have actually dealt extensively with differential equations that were separable via multiplication and division in calculus AB. Today is going to be just a return uh, to, that, uh, to that concept. Uh, we're going to be separating this differential equation right here and then finding the function that it was that this derivative is supposed to be representative of. And so the way I'm going to separate this, uh, this differential equation here is I'm going to separate the terms by multiplying both sides by y squared as well as multiplying the dx over. So I group all of my y pieces together and I got x squared dx here. At this point, once my terms are separated, and again, that's a really important step in the differential equation solving of an AP exam, we integrate both sides, so we end up with y cubed over 3 equaling x cubed over 3 plus c. Now, in case you don't remember, the plus c technically does show up on both sides, right? But um, we end up having to subtract the c from one side to the next, and ultimately c is just representing some type of constant of some kind. And so that issue ends up resolving itself at the very end. You know, case in point, when I multiply both sides by 3, I'm going to get y cubed equals x cubed plus not 3c, right? Because 3 times c, with 3 being a constant, is really just c. And so with this problem here, once I'm in a good enough position, and, and when I determine what a good enough position is, is somewhat arbitrary, I'm going to go ahead and solve for c. In my case, or in the case of this problem, there's no weird absolute value or any kind of square root going on. So I think solving for c is going to be pretty easy. I know that 2 cubed is going to be the result of 0 cubed plus c, which means c is going to be equal to 8. And at this point, what I've got here is I'm going to go back to the safest place that I can, which is going to be right here. y cubed equals x cubed plus 8. And then I simply cube root both sides in order to find out the equation that this differential equation represented. And that would be the function whose derivative was represented by this differential equation right here. So what exactly did we just find? Well, remember in the last section, we talked about slope fields, right? And how a differential equation is the is almost like the analytical version of a slope field, but the slope field is the graphical representation of the differential equation with all of its variants, right? All of the different plus Cs and minus Cs that could have actually happened out there. And that is why the slope field actually looks like this when I when I put this dude into Desmos, right? This is all the different variations of uh, x cubed plus c underneath the square uh, underneath the cube root symbol. And so what I was looking for specifically was this was this point here, not point zero, it's a zero, zero comma two. And so um, I was looking for that. And so what I want is I is I want to know exactly what curve that is that fits through that point. And so what I did was I put this uh, function here, the function that we ended up finding uh, as part of our investigation, and I'll go and highlight it now. And instead of looking for the potential function anywhere on this slope field, I was looking for that particular function there. If you can see it, it's in green. It's the one that passed through there. It's that weird looking uh, diagonal um, hump, I guess. Um, and so, yeah, so that's what finding the specific function is when solving a differential equation. You're given an initial value, you're finding the specific curve that passes through the point of any given slope field. So hopefully that makes sense. I'll be back with another example. Give me one second. All right, so another... Another application of differential equations is in particle motion. Now, we remember this from Calc AB, right? When we had the three layers, there was position. Position's derivative was velocity, and velocity's derivative was acceleration. And so we're, we're being asked to find the position function given, given the following information here. And so if I've got dv over dt, well, first thing that I would hope that we remember is that dv over dt is acceleration, right? So a of t is equal to this. And so we're so this function right here, this 2t plus cos t, is in fact an acceleration function, right? Which means we're going to end up having to do a differential equation model twice on this thing in order to move backwards two layers up into position. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to go ahead and just do what we did in the last problem, but one more time. So I'm going to go ahead and separate my terms over. dv is equal to 2t plus cos t dt. And then I'm going to go and integrate both sides. So I've got v equaling, looks like t squared, uh, the integral of uh, cos t, uh, cosine 
is going to be sine. And that's going to be, I'll go, I'll go and call it plus C, I'll go maybe C1. In order to solve for C1, I'm going to use this initial condition right here. So I've got 30 equaling 0 plus sine 0 plus C1. So those guys are all gone. C1 equals 3, so we're good with that. My velocity function then is going to be t squared plus sine t plus 3. And that's what my velocity function is. However, I'm not done yet because they do want a position function on this thing. And so what I have to remember about, about um, velocity is that velocity is the derivative of position. So if I want to write this guy as a differential equation, I could call him ds over dt or dx over dt if this was known to be a one-dimensional particle on the x-axis. Um, so that's going to be t squared plus sine t plus 3. Again, one more time, separate the terms. So what I've got is I've got ds equals t squared plus sine t plus 3 dt. And then I'm going to go ahead and integrate both sides like I did last time. And I get s is equal to t cubed over 3. Careful with the integral of sine. It's going to be negative cos, whoops, not cotangent, but cos of t plus 3t, and I'll go ahead and plus c2 on this one. And now, I have to remember that s of 0 equals 4, because I'm about to scroll off of this area, so I'm going to say 4 is equal to 0 over 3 minus cos of 0 plus 3 times 0 plus c2. Now be careful, they're not all going to go away. That's what they want you to think. This dude's actually become negative 1, so please remember that good old unit circle of ours. c2 is equal to 5. And so what we get is we get a position function, ultimately, of, I'm gonna, and I'm going to pull from this guy here, s is equal to t cubed over 3 minus cos t plus 3t plus 5. And that is the position function two layers up from the acceleration function. So again, another application of those differential equations. I'll be right back with, um, with a different kind of example. I'll be right back. So what happens when you're given a separable differential equation when and you can't integrate one of the sides because we just don't have a technique for it? And despite what you guys all think, this is definitely not a u sub problem. Because if I derive this e to the negative x squared, I'm going to get e to the negative x squared times a negative 2x. And while there's an x on bottom, there's no additional e that happens. And so we don't really have a technique for this one. So nevertheless, I am going to separate the terms, though. So dy equals e to the negative x squared over x. And I will actually integrate both sides. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to recall, I'm going to go ahead and recall a good old buddy of ours. I'm going to recall the FTC, which is the fundamental theorem of calculus. Fundamental theorem of calculus. And so what I have to remember is that on the side, if I was to integrate, let's say, from a to b of f prime of x dx, right? This is the fundamental theorem of calculus at work here. I'm going to get f of x on a to b, which is going to be, oops, f of b, f of b minus f of a, right? And so what I can do is I can effectively cut out the middleman here and say that the integral from a to b of f prime of x dx is equal to f of b minus f of a. So how does that help me with this expression here? Well, I can then say, I can then say that the integral from 1 to 3. Now, why did I choose from 1 to 3? Well, because they gave me an initial condition of 1, and they want me to find out 3. So I'll, back when I taught calc a, b, this was, uh, I would call this the anchor point. I would call this the anchor point. And that's where we anchor our definite integral. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and say, well, the integral from uh, 1 to 3 of f prime of, oops, uh, let's say f prime of uh, uh, x dx, right, is going to be f of 3 minus f of 1, right? And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to apply that idea into this problem here. So I know that y is equal to the integral from 1 to 3 of e to the negative x squared over x dx. 
Now on the side here, I'm gonna go ahead and kick this guy down. So I'm gonna go ahead and say the integral from one to three of e to the negative x squared over x dx. Well, that's gonna be f of three minus f of one. Well, what do I know? I feel like I know one of these things already. So I'll go ahead and say that uh, f of three minus, well, f of one was seven, right? So seven is right here. So then that's going to be from one to three e to the negative x squared over x. I'm gonna kick the seven over. So seven plus the integral from one to three of e to the negative x squared over x dx. And then that is actually just gonna be put into a calculator. So yes, I cheated. I put it into an integral calculator and I got 7.110 uh, equals f of three. And that is after we uh, added the seven to it. So that integral is 0 0.110, we added the seven, we got f of three. These types of problems would very likely be calculator or set up but don't solve. Um, if it was set up but don't solve, you would just leave it like that. All right, I'll be back with another example. Give me a second. All right, let's witness the return of an old friend, an old, old friend. It's something that you guys probably haven't thought about in a long time. Let's just go ahead and do this differential equation here. I'm going to give you an initial condition here of y of 0 equals 5. Now, if you'd like, go ahead and pause and see if you can do this one on your own. You'll see something kind of happen, and, uh, and it'll be pretty obvious as soon as we get this, uh, this integral started here. So Let's go and take care of it. We've got, uh, looks like one over y dy, right? If I'm gonna divide both sides by y, I'm going to multiply the x over, so that equals x squared dx. When I integrate both sides, I'm gonna get the natural log of absolute value of y is equal to x cubed over three plus c. At this point in time, I'm probably not gonna solve for c yet, and there's no problem with actually doing it. I just choose not to. Uh, I, I like to wait until the y is by itself before I solve for c when it comes to these types of problems. It's just a style. So how do I get y by itself? I am going to change forms. I'm gonna say the absolute value of y equals e to the negative x cubed over three plus c. And then because the two exponents are being added, I can go ahead and say then that e to the x cubed over three is being multiplied by e to the c. I just reverse engineered our exponent rules from integrated math one. e to the c is c. So c e to the x cubed over three equals absolute value of y. Now whether c is positive or negative because of the result of the absolute value is of no consequence, right? It's just a constant. So I can actually just bust down and say that y is equal to c e to the x cubed over three. And now this is, for me, the most comfortable place to go and solve for c. Uh, it's entirely up to you, but I remember that y of 0 is equal to 5, so I'll go and scroll down here. So 5 is equal to c e to the 0, so c equals 5. This guy can now become y equals 5 e to the x cubed over 3. So return of an old friend, this is what gave us our exponential function. Uh, and so, yeah, be sure to expect those quite a bit because exponential functions are going to pay are going to play quite a role in uh, in calculus BC. I'll be uh, back with the uh, next example. In our last example here, we got a problem about a Christmas tree and uh, and the rate of its height, uh, the rate of its uh, growth in, in its height. It says the silvery blue green coloring of the Colorado blue spruce makes it a perfect Christmas tree for a tree farmer in upstate New York when a seedling is planted at time equals zero. The height of the tree is one foot. So it looks like they're giving us an initial condition here. So H of zero equals one. Uh, and it says, uh, if the height of the tree at time equals T years after it's planted, the rate of growth is proportional to the difference between its maximum height. There's that proportional rate again. We're gonna talk about that when we get to, uh, when we get to exponential growth in the next lesson. Um, so the uh, height is the rate of height is given by this differential equation right here, dh over dt equals this thing. So they ask us a series of questions, um, and so here we go. It says, is the tree growing faster when it is two feet or four feet? Explain your reasoning. Okay, well that's not. I don't think that's terrible. So dh dt when h equals two versus dh over dt when h equals four. All right, let's find out what that is. 3 over 20 times 10 minus 2 versus 3 over 20 times 10 minus 4. Okay, so 8 and 6. So that's going to be, it looks like these guys, 24 over 20, which reduces because they both divide by 4. So 6 over 5. 
Uh, let's see, 18 over 20, which reduces by, because they both divide by two, so uh, nine over 10. Well, clearly this one's larger. So the tree is growing faster when H equals two. The tree is growing faster when H equals two because we can say then that dh over dt at h equals 2 is greater than dh over dt at h equals 4. Pretty simple justification right there, uh, I, I think. Uh, moving on to b. Uh, let's see here. Find d squared h over dt squared in terms of t. Use this expression to explain why the graph of the solution curve is concave down. Okay, so at any point, if you feel like, you know, after seeing part A, you're like, oh, this seems like a pretty easy uh, type of question, feel free to pause and see if you can finish this uh, on your own and then check your answer with me when you're done. Uh, it's not a big deal. Uh, it seems kind of threatening at first. There's a lot of reading, but I think once you see the first problem, you're kind of like, okay, I feel like we can probably tackle this. Um, so in this case, to find dh over d, uh, d squared h over dt squared, uh, dh over dt equals 3 over 20 times 10 minus h. I'm going to go and take the derivative, and then that's going to be d over dt, right? So then that's going to be d squared h over dt squared. It's going to be the 3 over 20 is going to kick out. And what I'm going to get is I'm going to get, looks like, uh, let's see, the derivative of 10 is going to go away, but the derivative of negative h is going to be negative dh over dt. So what I've got is I've got uh, 3 over 20 times, I'll kick the negative out here, but dh over dt was originally this guy, right? It was originally this equation, so I'll plug him back in. So another 3 over 20 times 10 minus h. So what I've got is I've got, looks like negative 9 over 400 times 10 minus h equals my second derivative here. So now we have to describe and explain why the graph is always concave down. Well, if we look at what the domain of this function is, it says, um, okay, so it says we have a tree that's one foot and it says the maximum height is 10 feet. So if we look at um, if we look at on the interval from 1 to 10, uh, in ter and this is height, right? This is height. And so from here, from 1 to 10, this guy is always positive, right? But he's always being multiplied by a negative number. So this is always negative. And so you could then justify this by saying, on the interval, uh, let's see here, uh, 1 to 10. And I'll go and just give myself some extra space here because I can't type that in with the thing. Uh, is always negative. Therefore, whoops, therefore, uh, the graph of H will always be concave down. And I'll put that in yellow, that way we can actually read it. Uh, right there. So from here, um, what, what was I saying is always negative? Well, we're going to say uh, d squared h over dt squared, right? We saw that happen. Uh, anytime you have a negative times a positive, it's gonna be negative. So we justify it by saying the second derivative is always negative and therefore the graph of h is always concave down. Part C asks us to find an equation of the tangent line um, at the point where t equals zero. And then we have to draw, uh, we have to use that line to approximate the height of the tree at, a, at, at one year. So is the estimate over or under? We gotta explain our reasoning. So this sounds like linear approximation. So linear approximation is gonna make us triumphant return. We haven't talked about that probably since Calc AB, but it looks like they want us to uh, um, find the tangent line at uh, t equals zero. So we know that h of zero equals one. That was the point of our initial condition, or at least one of the points of our initial condition. So what that tells me is it tells me the shell of my equation of my line is gonna be y minus one is equal to some kind of t minus zero. All we need is a slope, right? Well, to find slope, we have, we have to take the derivative, except this time, because we already have one. We know that dh over dt is equal to something, I forget what that is, 3 over 20 times 10 minus h. 3 over 20 times 10 minus h. Now, that's our slope anywhere, but in this case, I think they're going to want us to find the slope at 
zero. And so uh, dh over dt is equal to three over 20 times 10 minus now. I know I just said zero, but what I meant was time equaling zero. So a mistake you're gonna make is you're gonna plug zero into here and that would be bad. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna be smarter about it. We're gonna plug in a one because this function here is h and not t. So what I've got is I've got three over 20 times nine. So that makes this 27 over 20. So what I have is y equals 27 over 20t plus one. So this is my equation of my tangent line at t equals zero, but I'm going to go ahead and use this to, to estimate the height of the tree at one year. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, that means that y of one is gonna approximately be equal to 27 over 20 times one, plus 20 over 20. I'll just get a, get a common denominator here. So what I get is 47 over 20 for my height at one approximately. Now, how do I know if this is an over or an underestimate? Well, remember back in linear approximation, we learned that over and underestimations is all based on concavity. So we learned that on one to 10, the function's always concave down because our derivative is always negative. So this has got to be when it comes to concave down and a linear, in fact, I'll even really accentuate a concave down and a linear approximation, there is no way you're gonna be anything other than an overestimation no matter where you, no matter where you are. So that's how we're gonna justify this. We're gonna say d squared h over dt squared is less than zero, in other words, negative, right? On the interval from one to 10, therefore, h is concave down. Therefore, our linear approximation must be over. And always make sure you include that interval because uh, they want to make sure that it's concave down on the entire thing. All right, let me clean up the board a little bit. I'll be back with the last two problems. I'll be right back. Part D, they're asking us now to go ahead and find the particular solution with the initial value h of zero equal one. So it looks like we gotta separate terms. This is a classic differential equation problem. I'm gonna go ahead and say one over 10 minus h dh is equal to three over 20 dt. I'll go and integrate both sides. I know that three over 20 t plus c is on the right side, but what I gotta be careful of is this is ln of absolute value of 10 minus h, and that's gonna be negativized because of rule chain. All right, remember that negative h is going to be there. So from here, let's go ahead and multiply both sides by negative one. So what I have is ln of absolute value of 10 minus h equals negative three over 20 plus c. Let's go and uh, exponentiate this thing, change form. So I've got 10 minus h in absolute value is equal to e to the negative three over 20 t uh, plus c. I'll go and just kick the c out in front because we're, we've seen that move before. So 10 minus h in absolute value equals c e to the negative three over 20 t. And of course, it doesn't matter if it's plus or minus, we're gonna get 10 minus h equals c e to the negative three over 20 t. At this point, it'd be a great time to just go and solve for c. So we know that h of zero equals one. So we know that 10 minus one, 10 minus one is equal to c e to the zero. So I know that c equals nine. And here we go. We're going to go and say 10 minus h equals nine e to the negative three over 20 t. And I'll go and just flip flop these guys and I got 10 minus nine e to the negative three over 20 t equals h. And that is my differential equation. That is this, or that is the solution to the differential equation right there. That is the function that gives me the height of the tree at any given time. And so in the last problem here, what they're asking us to do is they're saying, if a tree is harvested when its height is eight feet, at what time t will a blue spruce be ready to sell? Well, basically what they're trying to do is they're asking me to find out how long it's going to take uh, for the tree to reach eight feet, right? And so 
using the uh, using the exponential function that we just found in D or in C, we'll use that in D. So I'm going to say 10 equals negative 9e to the 3 over 20t equals 8 at this point. That's my target height. Uh, I don't know why I put an equals 2 sign right there. Whoops. That should be a minus. Sorry about that. So I'm going to go ahead and again, flip flop these guys. And I've got 2 equaling 9e to the 3 over 20t. 2 ninths equals e to the 3 over 20t. And again, there's no way, and you probably haven't heard this since integrated 3, but there is no way that 2 over 9 and e are going to ever share the same base. So we have to natural log both sides. So I get the natural log of 2 ninths equaling 3 over 20t. I'm going to divide by 3 over 20. And t is going to equal the natural log of 2 ninths over 3 over 20, which if you punch it into a calculator, you will get 10.027 years. So I feel like it's a pretty straightforward differential equation. Um, yeah, that'll wrap it up for uh, this problem here. And I think it'll wrap it up for this episode. So as always, please leave comments or questions in the comments area. And I will see you all in the next episode.